Well, good morning. Those who got up bright and early on a Saturday to come out and hear us. Yep, we've also got people joining us online and on our YouTube channel, the General Revelation Institute on YouTube. This is our first morning. We had our, our talk last night where we discussed what is the Great Commission and how to understand it, how it shapes the whole Christian life and how it was uh, our duty from the very beginning of creation, even before the fall, to fill the earth with the knowledge of God. Today we're going to get into some more details about the Great Commission. I'm going to begin with some introductory comments about what we do, what are we teaching in the Great Commission. And then Dr. Steve Rutt will be speaking about the progress of Christian missions down through the centuries. And then that will take us up until lunch. And if you want to see the rest of the schedule, you can go to generalrevelation.org, and our schedule for the day is there. It's going to be a great day. We've also got uh, Dr. Matt Nolan here with us, who will be speaking this afternoon. So what is the Great Commission? What are we doing? We talked last night about the origins of the Great Commission and how it's really shaped all of history. We could understand history itself through the lens of the Great Commission in contrast to other ways of approaching history. I mentioned last night the Marxist way of approaching history. Another very popular view today is the Freudian view of history, which tells us that it's mostly uh, sexual development and sexual identity. Both of those have really captured the minds of contemporary America, especially the academic world, who then teaches it to their captive audience in classes. So what is the Christian doing in contrast to that? What is the Christian offering by way of the Great Commission? The very first point, and, and one that rejects both of those worldly philosophies I just mentioned, is that it simply begins with the truth that God is. And in Hebrews 11.6, we're told that those who come to God must believe that he is, and that he's the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So just as sin leads to death, so too seeking God leads to life. That's the reward. That's what, what God told Abraham. I am your very great reward. And so we're teaching that God is, in contrast to the worldly philosophies, all of which deny God's existence in one way or another. You'll find that they have some highest being, so you might find an Aristotle who speaks about an unmoved mover. But this is not the God of creation and providence. This is a, a, a really almost an impersonal being who doesn't rule over the world at all. And then you'll have others who don't even say there is a God. They'll, they'll be purely materialist, like the Marxists. Or you'll have those who are pantheists, and they say that everything is God. There's no distinction between God and the creation. So we're teaching that God is. We want, therefore, to have a good definition of God from the very beginning. And I'll be using the definition from the Westminster Shorter Catechism, question four, which is that God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchanging, in being, wisdom, power, holiness, goodness, justice, and truth. In the Great Commission, you're teaching the nations all of those things about God, and all of those things are knowable from general revelation. All of us have an obligation, a duty before God to know all of those things I just mentioned. A lot of times what we find happening is that general revelation is narrowed down and people will say it gives you just a shadowy, vague impression of a higher being and you need the Bible to fill in the details. But the definition I just gave you is a very full definition. And each of those properties is knowable from general revelation. We can and should know that. And so that's the first thing we're telling the nations. That's the way that Paul begins his systematic theology in Romans. The, the clear revelation of God's eternal power and divine nature to all people. And so that's the beginning for us as well, that God is. And, and when we have a weak doctrine of God, when we present something about God that is limited, we're not fulfilling the Great Commission. We're unnecessarily hampering ourselves and limiting ourselves instead of beginning with a full and clear definition of God. So that's the first point of what we're doing in the Great Commission. Second point, the Great Commission, after the fall, is teaching about sin. And so just like we need a full definition of God, we'll need a full definition of what sin is. 
And many times you'll find the Great Commission is hindered and narrowed because the definition of sin is narrowed. Sin is limited to the will by many persons. In fact, my talk this afternoon will be about hindrances to the Great Commission. And I'll be one of them. Thinking of sin mainly as a problem of the will that you know what to do and you don't do it. And so you only address people in their will and tell them, start doing what you already know what to do. But the way that sin is defined, whether we look at Psalm 14 or Romans 3, is that none seek and none understand and none do what is right. That last one is the will, but it's preceded by these first two. They're not seeking God. Do you see how that follows or is related to Hebrews 11.6? God rewards those who diligently seek him and none seek. It doesn't say the masses don't seek, but there's a few wise teachers that seek. In fact, it might be the reverse. They're, they all the more don't seek the teachers of the world and the worldly philosophy. None seek God. Or uh, Isaiah 1.3 puts it this way. Not only are unbelievers not seeking God, it says, my own people don't know me. The people of God who often have the pretension and then the security of thinking that they're the, the chosen ones are not seeking God. That'd be true both in the Old and the New Testament. Find Christians in that same boat. Christians of all persons should be able to say what is clear about God, but when they're asked, they often get upset at you and tell you you don't need to do that. So none are seeking. We begin with sin there, just like David and just like Paul. The condition of the human is that they're seeking everything else but God. And seeking is another way of saying loving. You seek what you love. If you read the Song of Songs about Solomon, you'll see the lover seeking out the beloved. So none seek, none love God, even though that's the first command. And because of that, they don't understand. That's a sin. My own people don't know me. The ox knows his manger. My people don't know me. They don't understand. And so what you're doing in the Great Commission is you're speaking to people who are loving something besides God and who don't understand themselves or God. Because those come together. If you understood God, you understood saying yourself. And in our day, isn't that really what you hear young people talking about? They claim to want to know themselves. And yet they look everywhere besides God, the creator, particularly they look to some kind of uh, odd sexual identities that they've invented. Freudian, well, I'll call it the Freudian religion. And the Freudian religion has invented these, uh, this, this idea of sexual identity and sexual development. And it's become very popular. But that's because they don't understand themselves. They don't understand who God is. And out of that comes not doing what is right. A lot of times in evangelism, the evangelist will only focus on that last one. And maybe specific sins like pornography and drunkenness, drug use. And those are sins, no doubt about it, but they're rooted in the first two. You didn't love God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You didn't love or fear God. And so you're not wise. And so you fell into these other things that are foolishness. You didn't understand. So the Great Commission teaches that God is, and then it teaches that what sin is and the failure to love God. Third, we'll teach redemption. Again, post-fall. Before the fall, we're still doing number one. Post-fall, we're teaching about the truths of redemption that were, were taught to us from the very beginning in the coats of skin covering Adam and Eve, the death of another to cover their sins. And so we'll teach you that Christ alone is a source of redemption, a seed of the woman that was promised also from the very beginning. We're not teaching uh, another philosophy, a self-help theory, a way to have more discipline, 12 rules of how to clean your room and get a job. The world is full of such teachers. They come and go every generation. They make their million and they leave and the next one comes up. We're not teaching that. We're teaching redemption through Christ alone. Now that has a side benefit of shaping up your life. But you could try to shape your life up without Christ. And the demons come back and bring seven friends and say, hey, this is great. I, I can use a disciplined person much more than an undisciplined person, right? I mean, if you're a demon, who do you want on your side? A disciplined person or undisciplined person? You want a disciplined person. 
So you say that they'll tell them, yes, please read about 12 rules. But now we're teaching that redemption comes only through Christ because here's your problem. Your problem isn't that you don't clean your room and you don't have a job. Your problem is that you're alienated from God, your creator. And no rules, no rule following will ever get you back to peace with God. You've heard it said, blessed are the peacemakers, and maybe you thought that was just among humans. No, the peacemakers are bringing the message about how to have peace with God because you, in your natural condition, are at enmity with God. Only Christ, of all the, all the messengers of the world, none of them even say they can do that. They, uh, they, don't, they, they teach something contrary to number one. Only Christ teaches this. And with that teaching about Christ come these other things, representation. That you were represented by Adam who sinned. And now you're represented, if you if you're put your faith in Christ, you'll be represented by him on the cross. And that's what is called vicarious atonement. Welcome. Vicarious atonement. You can't atone for your sins. Your sin has alienated you from God. What you owe God is yourself. But you've squandered that. Even if you were to stop sitting today and be perfect for the rest of your existence, that doesn't make up for the first part where you weren't. It'd be like you think that you cut your credit cards up and that pays off the debt. No, that just means you don't incur more debt. But what will you do about the debt you already have? You can do nothing. That's vicarious atonement, atonement through the death of another. And that was what was taught all the way from Genesis 3, the coverings of skin. We know Noah and Abraham offered sacrifices, which symbolize this. And then, of course, the law of Moses and all the laws of the temple about sacrifice taught these truths to the ages. And then that also brings us to triple imputation, all three of these coming together, which is to say Adam's sin is imputed to us. So when you're doing the Great Commission, you're speaking to a world of sin. And that includes not just sins of commission and omission, but the original sin of the kind of world you're born into. You're born into a broken covenant before God. And so Adam's sin is imputed to you, but I had good news. This is the good news of the gospel. Your sin can be imputed to Christ. This is why messing with the historical Adam undoes everything else. If Adam was just a collection of somewhat hairless hominids, not even one person, but a collection of early hominids, you don't have it, representation or imputation. So, imputation of sin to us, our sin imputed to Christ, and even better news, Christ's righteousness imputed to us. When we're not righteous, but we're viewed as righteous before God because of Christ. That's the gospel message. That's the good news. But do you see how you had to do number one and two first? If you were just to, tell, if you were just to hand someone a medicine bottle and say, here, take these, or say, no, why? Why am I taking medicine? You'd have to tell them what the problem is, what the lack is. And if you deny number one, then you go straight to number two, you won't get none seek and none understand. And a lot of times that's what happens. They go straight to some sin. We'll call it a fruit sin that grows out of the root of not seeking God. You have to go to not seeking God. And to do that, it has to be clear God exists. There's a clear general relation to all persons. Fourth point. You're teaching in the Great Commission what is eternal life. There's two other ways to say this, that you're teaching what is the chief end of man. That's how it's put in the Westminster Shorter Catechism, question one. The chief or highest end. And you're teaching what is the good. That's how it's spoken of in philosophy. Those all three mean the same thing. The highest end, the good, eternal life. And that's defined, I should say John 17, 3, as knowing God. Life isn't the animation of your material body. You could have that and be in death. Life is knowing God. And you can know God. This should amaze you. This should blow your mind. I mean, I know you'd be amazed if I was to say, and now look behind you, everyone. And out comes your favorite celebrity. Probably for you, it's Taylor Swift. 
And out comes Taylor Swift. You wow, I can know Taylor Swift. Mind but ball. Uh, obviously, I don't. I know it'd be what Post Malone, Cardi B. I went to McDonald's the other day. I know I'm a, I'm a terrible parent. And there's the Cardi B menu at McDonald's, right? All right. So you'd want to know if it was a famous person, you'd want to know this person. How about the one who created all things, who's infinite in power? Would you like to know that person? The fact that you can know God should be an unending source of joy. You should wake up and the first thing you realize is I can know God and your, your mind is blown by that. And through your whole day, I can know God. And your last thought before you fall asleep, I can know God. And then repeat all of your existence for all of eternity. And so that's what we're teaching. Many times the Great Commission gets watered down to something like this. Say the sinner's prayer so when you die, you go to heaven and you have a mansion and some gold streets. Now, we were talking a little bit about economics last night, and I need to warn you that if the streets are paved with gold, this destroys the value of gold and causes significant inflation, right? So, so it might be reverse. In, in heaven, asphalt is super expensive because you can't find it anywhere, and gold is and eh, the way we treat asphalt. These are images, and people take them to be physical things, and they look forward to heaven in the future when you can know God right now. And so we don't want to water down the promise, the promise to give to Abraham. Your blessing, God says, is me. You get to know God. And you know God in the fallen world. You know God in the intermediate state. They call heaven after death, before the resurrection. And you know God in the new heavens and the new earth. And then finally, you're teaching the moral law, the Great Commission. Teach them to observe whatsoever I have commanded you. That's the moral law that's written on our hearts, Romans 2.15. Now, to do that, you need to know the moral law, and unfortunately, when I quiz Christians about it, they're very wobbly on it. I mean, they'll get a couple things like, don't lie, don't steal, don't cuss. Generally, they think, yeah, uh, licentiousness and drunkenness are wrong. But what about number two? Can you show the beginning of the law? Do you know the greatest commandment? It's to love God. And, and you can't teach that if you don't know number four. That our highest good is to know God. And you can't teach number four unless you know number one. That God exists. And so if you're going around just telling people God exists and you can't even show it, you may as well be saying there's a leprechaun in your backyard. This is an imaginary being. How do you know there's a God? Christian, have you been challenged by that? Have you risen to the challenge? It's been a challenge from the very beginning when the serpent said, did God really say... That's the beginning of atheism on down to the present where your culture is wrestling with Freudianism and Marxism. And you may have family and friends or you yourself may have been drawn into those false systems and they'll destroy lives. They'll destroy the culture. But to address those, you've got to do number one. The main problem with those two systems is that they've rejected what is clear about God. So the moral law begins there. Love the Lord your God. And in order to do that, you need to teach people what is lovely about God. If you're just a depressed Christian, what are you? You don't even believe God is lovely. What are you teaching to the world? What are you teaching to the nations? Really, what comes across then is you're teaching some kind of legalistic system. Do these things, and you'll be on God's good side. So when you die, you go to heaven. That's just Phariseeism. How do Christians slip back into that? You should be teaching that God is the chief end of our love. God and knowing God is what we want above all else. And then from there, the moral law follows easily because you want to please God. The moral law is not a burden. Christ's yoke is light. And you want to please God, and so you want to live the way that God has commanded. What the moral law does is it's, it's the path that takes us to knowing God. You can't know God in any other way except for by this. Now, the Westminster Shorter Catechism says the moral law is summarized in the Ten Commandments. And the Ten Commandments are further summarized in the first and greatest commandment, to love God. So you as a Christian should be able to go from the love of God to the topics the Ten Commandments cover 
to the application of the Ten Commandments in all of life. That's part of discipling the nations, and you won't be able to do that if you're not being discipled, which is what occurs at church. And that's why you need to be in a church and be in a church that can disciple you in these points. If you're not being discipled in these points, you won't be able to partake of the Great Commission. Now, the analogy to that has always been the people of Israel in the desert. The Great Commission is physically represented by the conquest of the promised land. Now, we know in our day, we fight not by weapons of this world, but by spiritual weapons. So that's why I say it's an image for us. We're teaching the good news of Christ and converting. But you know, if you've read your Old Testament, that of the 12 spies, 10 of them came back and said it can't be done. And there are Christians like that today who will say numbers 1 through 5 can't be done. Don't listen to that. So the temptation could come from without, from the current appeal of Marx and Freud, and it could come from within, the 10 spies who are in the camp, and they say, no, you can't do number one. You can't do number two. We'll never fill the earth with the knowledge of God. It's getting worse and worse until Christ comes back. Our only hope between now and then is Kirk Cameron, that he'll be left behind to slow, slow it down. That's why today we're going to be learning about something called post-millennialism, which historically has been the major Protestant viewpoint. But you'll learn from Dr. Rutt, he has his Schofield Reference Bible, which was very influential in teaching something called pre-mill dispensationalism. And yet for Dr. Rutt, it was the means of becoming a post-millennialist, and he's going to share that story with you. So Christians, can you do Numbers 1 through 5? Are you with Joshua and Caleb? Now you might say, I'm not sure how we'll do it, but in principle I'm with them. That's the best start, that's fine. Because then you're in church, you're being discipled about how to do this. How to fill the earth with the knowledge of God, or how to demolish all arguments that raise themselves up against the knowledge of God. 2 Corinthians 10.5 now, we're ending a talk with an amen. Do I get an amen? I don't hear that. Come on. All right. Amen. We'll do that. Any questions before Dr. Wright comes up? Andrew? What is understanding? Great question. What is understanding? Think about what you mean by that in any other area of life. If you understand something, you have a, pro a, a proposition in your mind, like 2 plus 2 is 4, and you can show that it's true. If you can do that, then at best you believe it and don't understand it. But that's very important why it says understand, not simply believe. Right? Understand. We're aiming for maturity. It is true you can be redeemed and immature. In fact, it says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Not get your PhD in theology and thou shalt be saved. But then we're also encouraged by Paul in Hebrews 6 to go on to maturity. Don't stay a baby forever. Which is to say there could be Christians who are babies and they stay babies forever. Grow up. Meet the challenges of your age. Be ready to take up arms in the spiritual battle. And those arms you're taking up is a sword of the word. That word is introduced to you in John chapter 1 as the eternal logos, which is the light of man. Learn about the logos and how to use it. So yeah, understanding. Think if you're interviewing an accountant for, for your taxes. Would you want to know they understand accountancy? And how would they show you that? Just tell you, I do, trust me. You probably want to see some portfolios they've done, right? Some evidence that they've done good accounting. Any area of life, you'd want proof. Now, what we're going to turn to next is how have missions been going? And how did Dr. Rutt become a post-millennialist? And what is post-millennialism? Dr. Rutt?
to be here on a Saturday morning early is impressive. So thank you. Uh, I'm going to be covering the advancement of Christ's kingdom, the application of the Great Commission by the English speaking people. And we're going to begin with a, a quote from Charles Spurgeon. How many of you know who Charles Spurgeon was? So in 1874, the Calvinist pastor and author from England, Charles Spurgeon, said the following in his exposition from, and these are the words from Psalm 86, verse 9, all nations whom thou hast made shall come and worship before thee, O Lord, and shall glorify thy name. So in 1874, this is what uh, Spurgeon said. David, King David, was not a believer in the theory that the world will grow worse and worse and that the dispensation will wind up with general darkness and idolatry. Not so do we expect, but we look for a day when the dwellers in all lands shall learn righteousness, shall trust in the Savior, shall worship thee alone, O God, and shall glorify thy name. The modern notion, and he was speaking of dispensationalism here, has greatly dampened the zeal of the church for missions. And the sooner it is shown to be unscriptural, the better for the cause of God. It neither consorts with prophecy, honors God, nor inspires the church with enthusiasm. How many of you are familiar with the dispensational teaching, dispensational premillennialism? Raise your hands. So, okay, so in uh, 10 years ago, this dispensational writer by the name of C.I. Schofield put together um, the new Schofield reference edition, or the first one, and then later a newer one. Um, this is the Bible I had in high school. Um, I sort of read it a lot. <laughs> I'll take a look at it. Uh, and in the, in the notes, um, within the Bible, because you got these little comments on passages of Scripture at the bottom, uh, the more that I would read those notes and reading the passages above it, I found a lot of inconsistencies as a teenager at the age of 16. Uh, I was brought up in the dispensational school, the idea that uh, basically um, why polish brass on a sinking ship? But the church is going to go down. The only hope we have is the second coming of Jesus and that you might as well get ready for the Lord's return. Things are going to get worse and worse. Or as one uh, modern pastor has said, we don't win. The church won't win. Um, and then he takes a, a shot at those that hold to a, a post-millennial perspective on the victory of the church and the triumph of Christianity throughout all the world and all the nations. Um, and I, I have a high respect for the certain uh, minister, I, I, I won't mention his name, but because he's steeped in dispensational thinking, there is this idea of why polish brass on a sinking ship? It's all going to go down anyway. Things uh, are all doom and gloom, and so really the gospel is effective in the hearts of people, but really in terms of any kind of transformation or revival worldwide where the nations are truly discipled before the Lord comes back again, uh, well, we have to wait until the second coming of Christ, and then we'll see it. Uh, now, with the dispensational premillennial view, there is a very materialistic understanding of that in a prop, in the, in the sense of where there will be the blessings of peace and prosperity on this earth, uh, but that'll be all after the second coming of Christ. And so I was brought up in that teaching. I was steeped in it, but at, in my teenage years, I began to question it. And the more that I, uh, and I, I devoured the scriptures, um, which are seeing now happening at Asbury with the revival that's occurring, 
Um, I was heavily involved in the Jesus movement. We saw this happening all over the country and in other countries. Uh, and it was a spontaneous uh, manifestation of God's spirit in the lives of people that were lost and were not seeking God and God sovereignly intervened in their lives. Uh, so in the midst of that, I'm teaching a lot of Bible studies in, in high school and street preaching and doing a lot of evangelism and mission um, uh, in the state along with my parents. And uh, But the more I read the scriptures, the more I began to, especially the Old Testament came alive, uh, alive to me. And, and then there was this Psalm, Psalm 110. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit at my right hand until... I make all your enemies your footstool. And I noticed that was quoted extensively throughout the New Testament, Psalm 110, verse 1. In fact, it's cited in the New Testament 17 times. Write that down, 17 times, where it speaks of the enemies of Christ will become his footstool, not while he's on earth, but while he's seated at the right hand of the Father. And the more I began to wrestle with that understanding and other passages from the Bible, the more I began to think, and I didn't come across this quote by Charles Spurgeon until years later, but yes, yeah, Spurgeon had it right that what happened was dispensationalism in many ways had uh, dampened the zeal of the church for missions. So my focus is going to be on missions. Um, my wife and I and our children have been quite involved in missions, uh, and in particular, um, I've worked within the context of um, the British countries, the British uh, colonies, we would say, or uh, the British Commonwealth. Uh, in my early 20s, I planted churches in Ontario, Canada, uh, the region where my wife is from. And then uh, in my mid-20s, we moved to New Zealand, which is a British Commonwealth country. And then I ended up years later doing my PhD work in England. We lived there for four years. So I, I'm pretty well immersed in the thinking of the English people. And uh, I have a high respect for um, the work of God amongst the English people uh, over the centuries. Uh, this quote from uh, Spurgeon is important. So now let's look at the text, Matthew chapter 28. Verse 18, well, let's go to verse 16. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. And when, he, when they saw him, they worshipped him, and, but some doubted. And then Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, Some authority has been given to me in heaven and earth for only a short period of time. You have to wait until my second return. And in the meantime, go, therefore, and try to make disciples of some of the nations. Baptize them, if possible. Teach them to observe all things. I'll be with you, sort of. I'll be in your heart. Um, but there is no such thing as a transformation of culture with truth. Oh, I am reading. Again, I have a detached retina that's been healing. Um, I'm reading from the RSV version, the reversed Steve's version. So let's look at the text again. And I'll give you a little bit um, of what the sense is from the Greek New Testament. Verse 18, Then Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, all authority, let's say that together, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on the earth. This is a what we call in Greek a timeless errorist. All authority has already been given to Christ, not some, all authority, and not just in heaven, but also on earth. So some of the things I'm going to say today, um, if you're coming from a viewpoint of uh, what some call the two-kingdom approach, where we can't really expect too much of the transformation of Christ within the culture, 
Um, you might have some questions at the end of my talks today. But notice what it says there in verse 19. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations. All right, so verse 18, it's a timeless aorist. All authority has been given to me. Jesus spoke as one already having authority that's boundless over all things, not some things. All things in heaven, upon earth, and even things under the earth is what St. Paul says in his letters. The risen Christ, we know, charged 500 people with world conquest. He gave them marching orders, a mission, but that this mission was not going to be something from, from them imposing it on people. It's that God has already prepared the ground. The harvest is plentiful. The laborers are few. And Jesus said, pray that the Lord will, would raise up laborers to go into this harvest. So God has already pre uh, prepared the soil. We just have to then go in and, and not with a defensive prof posture, but a offensive posture, not to offend. We offend the works of darkness. That's true. We confront it. But we go in, we're on the offense, we're not on the defense. And all athletes know you're not going to win a game if you only have good defense. You also have to have good offense. So on this mountain, because he's on a mountain when he gave this direction, he charges his 11 disciples. They're, they are without money, they are without an army, and they're without any state government to back them. So in verse 19, Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations. Now, this word go in the Greek text is parenthesis. It's a nominative, it is a nominative plural masculine participle first aorist, which is translated as as you are going or uh, as you go, make disciples. So it's not maybe you're going to make disciples. No. I have all authority in heaven and upon earth. Now go, go make disciples in all the nations. In other words, he's already prepared the soil. So we're on the offense, not on the defense here. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you even to the end of the age. So this message is basically the Great Commission is an extension of the original commission we have from Genesis chapter 1. Be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. So in many ways, I refer to this commission as the second Great Commission. The first commission is Genesis 1 in 20, verses 27 and 28. Uh, also in Matthew 16, verse 18, Jesus Christ said, I will build my church and the gates of hell, the gates of death will not prevail against it. Uh, in another place, Jesus said, while you're in the world, you will have trials, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. <laughs> now that's like, I have overcome the world. No, I have overcome the world, Jesus said. So we, we need to go with that kind of an understanding. And I want to show today, uh, between now and 1145, how the English-speaking people began to take this Great Commission and begin to act upon it uh, in their lives. Jesus, is authorita Jesus authoritatively sent his disciples to go and make these disciples, and as they do that, they're planting churches. In the historic church, we, this apostolic ministry exists not to be sidelined into some kind of ecclesiastical castle, but from historic precedent, it seeks to equip the ministry proactively and to advance the apostolic faith and to reproduce apostolic churches in response to Jesus's mission, the Great Commission, or the Second Great Commission. Um, 
I would, again, encourage you to go back to Genesis 1 on your own and, and see if there's any connection. I see a connection between Genesis 1, verses 27 and 28, and Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. So in the New Covenant, there is continuity with this cultural mandate, or what some call the Dominion Covenant, in what's generally referred to as the Great Commission. God's plan from the beginning has been to establish his kingdom on earth. Again, Genesis chapters 1 and 2 establish that in our thinking. So this means the church is not called to be Gnostics. We are not to be so heavenly minded we're of no earthly good. We are not to be just thinking about the sweet by and by. We're, not, we're supposed to be thinking about thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it already is in heaven. That's why our Lord directed us to pray that way. So God created Adam to be a king. Adam, as a king, was to subdue the earth and have dominion over it. So that kingship calling applies to us today. Adam was a king under God, so he was a subordinate king, because God is the, is the absolute king. Now, one of the basic themes of Scripture is that salvation restores man to his original purpose. In the beginning, God created man in his own image. And this task that God has given is a task of dominion. And the dominion began in the Garden of Eden. So God calls us to be a, a life culture, not a death culture, but a life culture. And we see it in our culture right now. Those that are pro-life, it's all about extending the life of Jesus. Right? Right? Zoe is the Greek word, bringing the life. In him is life, and his life is the light of men. God's cultural mandate is about life, liberty, and about the pursuit of happiness. Our constitutional forefathers understood that. Now, um, I'm going to be coming from, and this weekend we're, we're, we're coming from what's called a post-millennial perspective. That means we don't believe that, first of all, we don't believe that we're going to make this stuff happen. We're going to make revivals happen. No, it comes from this, the sovereign grace of God, that God in his times and his seasons pours out his spirit upon his people. He prepares a people, and quite often people, even in formerly Christian countries that have gone apostate or have um, are part of what some call the post-Christian culture. Does that mean it's over with and that God will not visit us again? No. Acts chapter 3, verse 21 clearly says that we are to be awaiting something from heaven. Acts 3, 21 says, times of refreshing from the presence of the Lord. That God is in the des always desires to refresh his people. And he has purposes. And again, the purposes are that we are going to disciple the nations before he comes back. So the post-millennial view is that the church will be triumphant in the earth through the preaching of the gospel and through a reliance on the ministry of the Holy Spirit, that God actually will accomplish the task, that the gospel is the power of God into salvation, and that the cross of Christ is central, that history changed at the cross. Jesus said, Jesus said, it is finished. He is now making all things new. Could I hear an amen on this? All right. Now, postmillennialism in many ways has been taught throughout church history, even though the term postmillennial was not used, uh, it was propagated later in time and they gave a label to it, but it was just the idea that, that the kingdom of God is here and Jesus is the king and Jesus is Lord, Lord over all, and so therefore we just take that message to the nations and we bring the kingdom of light into the kingdom of darkness and light always conquers darkness. So the church historically has taught that. The early church, we see this in the lives of the apostles. We see it in the 
in the apostolic fathers. We see it in the patristics. We see it throughout church history amongst the medieval church fathers. We see it in the time of the Reformation. And during the time of the Reformation, this really began to explode in the Western world. And that's where there was this uh, manifestation of missionary efforts throughout the whole world. Now, um, even in the 1800s, most denominations in the United States had a post-millennial outlook on life. You can find it, it, you can find it embedded in the, amongst the Methodist with John Wesley. You, you read his writings, and I don't, uh, I mean, there's certain things in his writings I really don't like, but Wesley as, uh, as an evangelist and church planter was fantastic. He really understood things, but he had a post-millennial understanding that Christ was going to conquer areas that seemed to be unconquered. And uh, he went with that message, as did George Whitfield. Now, um, when World War I happened, occurred, a lot of people in churches that had this, ex this, what we call an eschatology of victory or an eschatology of hope, uh, began to think differently. They became very pessimistic. And then World War II hit, and then a lot of people just kind of pulled back and said, let's just pray that Jesus comes back soon. Now, I can unpack this from different angles, but I don't have time to do this. Um, if you want to attend Arizona Christian University and you want a course taught on this, just suggest it and I will put one together. All right. But for today, one of the main um, persons emerged by the name of David Chilton in uh, the late 1970s. He, like me, was involved in the Jesus movement. He also was brought up, uh, and he went to Biola. Uh, he was brought up with a, a very dispensational way of thinking, but he became post-millennial in his thinking and began to write on this. And by 1985, he wrote this book, Paradise Restored, A Biblical Theology of Dominion. Now, at that time, this book was sold like wildfire, wildfire uh, around the world. Um, I met him in 1985. He and I hit it off really well, and we became brothers in Christ. Now, by the way, I was a post-millennialist ever be before David Chilton was. And I, by the way, I'm 68, but I'm, I've been a post-millennialist for 51 years. This spring, it'll be 52 years. So I have listened to all the arguments on the other sides, and the more that I listen, the more I keep getting pumped from the scriptures, that Jesus is Lord, he's king, and he's going to conquer the nations. So there's all the, all the crazy clown stuff going on in our culture right now is, it's all on display, it's, got to, it's already collapsing before us. We are at a point now to evangelize, to re-evangelize our country, but we, we do it through the preaching of the gospel, and let's rely on the Holy Spirit and God will, will more than likely surprise us and do a lot of things that we might not like. I'm preparing all, I'm a, I'm a Reformed Christian, so I'm saying to my Reformed buddies, there might be some things that will happen in this great awakening that's in the process right now, but certain things, we might have to be like Jonathan Edwards, where a lot of things were out of his control, and he tried to stop it, and finally he just said, okay, God's at work, and I'm just going to flow with it. That's basically what he did. So we have to be ready. We have to be ready for all the crazies in our country, culture right now. And I'm talking about people that don't even know if they're a male or female. We have to be ready that when the Holy Spirit moves upon them, we have to be ready to disciple these kind of people. They're going to need, and, and you're going to have to kind of adjust. And in, in the history of Christianity, cultures have have gone through these kinds of things and and those that are christians that are like just kind of in their comfort zone you got to get you got to be ready for all sorts of interesting things to transpire because when god works we got to catch up with it i call this spirit before order as a missiologist all right so what did chilton say uh, just one quote here and by the way um, my, my friend David Chilton was with the Lord. Um, I have thousands of his books. Um, quite a few thousand were destroyed 
uh, up in Northern California because of mold and things like that. So his wife called me after David died and just said, hey, you know, can you get the books down to Phoenix? Well, Phoenix is an ideal place, right? The Dead Sea Scrolls lasted, right, because of a dry climate. So uh, Darlene was kind of thinking like, yeah, a drier climate is probably good for David's books to preserve them. So I have quite a few thousand of those books here on campus, and I also have uh, a thousands uh, at, at my house. Um, that said, Chilton said this, throughout the Old Testament, the prophets increasingly looked forward to a time when God's appointed king would come and sit on the throne. One of the Psalms most often quoted by the New Testament authors shows God the Father telling his son, the king, ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. Psalm 2 verses 8 and 9. This is also the Psalm that says, he that sits in the heavens laughs and he holds them all in derision, which literally means when God laughs, he lets people speak in an unintelligent manner. That's the best definition for our American culture right now, even out of Washington, D.C. They speak in an unintelligent manner. God is laughing. And when God laughs, be ready for God to do something to surprise us all. All I'm doing is preparing your hearts and your minds and be ready because we're going to be discipling a lot of people in our culture, in our nation. So let's, let's have a level of preparation for this. Chilton goes on to say, the prophets made it clear that like Adam, the coming king was to rule over the entire world, not only over Israel. And then he quotes from Psalm 72. He shall have dominion also from sea to sea and from the rivers to the ends of the earth. Those who dwell in the wilderness shall bow down before him and his enemies shall lick the dust. Yes, all kings shall fall down before him. All nations shall serve him. God showed Daniel an outline of history in which a towering statue representing the four empires of Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome is struck down and crushed by a stone. And Daniel, in Daniel 2, verse 35, it says, And the stone that struck the, st the statue became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. The meaning of this vision is, is the restoration of Eden under the king, under King Jesus, as Daniel explained. And this is Daniel 2, verse 44. The meaning of this vision, then, is of this restoration. In those days, kings, uh, this is during the Roman Empire, kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed, and that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all those kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever. Daniel 2, 44. Christ, the second Adam, will perform the task assigned to the first Adam, causing the holy mountain to grow and encompass the entire world. So what's being said there is that scripture is very clear already. And when I was a teenager, again, using my Schofield reference Bible, I would read the passage of scriptures and go like, wow, Maybe Jesus is not coming back right away. Uh, mind you, I had, a bump, I had a bumper sticker in my car that said Jesus is coming. But I'm now even beginning to question, like, well, maybe he's not in a hurry to come back. Because I literally, and I, I even prayed, Lord, I hope I get married before you come back. Well, I've been married, and there's my wife of 47 years sitting there. Yes, it does. And I knew her for two years prior to that, so 49 years. So, but I really was, uh, as many were in, in, in my day in the 1960, late 60s and early 70s, we were, all we heard was Jesus is coming back real soon. But the more I read the scriptures, the more I began to see that might not be the case. And again, the, uh, I'd, I'd read the, Schofield's notes and then go like, that's contrary to what I see in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments. Now, he had a lot of things good to say in his, in his notes within the Schofield Bible, but, but not everything. The dispensational scheme has actually, in many ways, been, um, it's caused the church to be impotent. 
So, last night, a doctor and made a comment about Marxism. It's an ideology, it's a worldview, it's a religion. But Marxism has an eschatology of dominion. So Francis Nigel Lee, back in 1973, I think it is, wrote this book, Communist Eschatology. This is the title of it. Just a little book. Communist Eschatology, a Christian Philosophical Analysis of the Post-Capitalistic Views of Marx, Engels, and Lenin. Um, at the very beginning of his book, he makes this statement as an introduction by Dr. Francis Nigel Lee. To the glory of the triune God, whose name is worn by all the baptized. To God the Father of the fundamental dominion charter, Genesis 1.28. God the Son of the central great commission, Matthew 28, verse 19. God the Spirit of the terminal kingdom vocation, Luke chapter 11, verse 2. Of whom and through whom and to whom are all things. Be glory forever throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. That's how he begins his book, because he said he's basically his thesis is communism has an eschatology, but we have an eschatology in the Bible that far surpasses Marxist Leninism. And that's what we've got to be able to deal with. And dispensationalism in many ways has caused the church to cower back, to go into our churches, to pull up the drawbridge and just wait for Jesus to come back. And that is not what we're called to do. As Christians, we are called to be salt and light and to go into the world and transform culture with his truth. Amen? All right, so this book is quite interesting. The Marx's Mao Zedong had an eschatology. But we are to counter Marxism, and we do it with the scriptures. All right, I'm only get, just get beginning here. I'm on page three and I have 28 pages here, I think it is. Okay, let me check the time here. Okay, I'll take about another 11 minutes and we'll take a break. Um, so there was a liberal scholar by the name of Adolf von Harnack. Uh, and he was on the he was on the left, we would say, but he did an analysis of the first three centuries of Christianity's growth, and he wrote this in a book called "The Mission and Expansion of Christianity." He wrote it in 1902, and it's a great statement. He takes the first 280 years of Christianity. Now, mind you, Israel is called to be a light to the nations. Israel did not fully accomplish that. But we know the reason why is because Christ had to come as the last Adam and to be able to deal with sin and to then be able to put the curse in reverse and to be able to make it so that then the church becomes empowered by the Holy Spirit to go out and to be the light to the nations, to truly, Jesus truly is the Israel of God. Now, Harnack systematically looked at the first 280 years of Christianity. Where, and you gotta, you got to compare this with Israel's, the, the greatest time of Israel's uh, um, fulfillment of the commission from Genesis 1 was under Solomon, that the glory of Israel went, the glory of God, of Yahweh, went everywhere to the whole world. Uh, but then even that, it was short-sighted and then fell apart afterwards. Christ had to come. God had to become man to be able to put the curse in reverse. So Harnack then says, something significant happened with the coming of Christ. So 280 years here now. So the first 70 years, first 70, 70, after the foundation of the very 
first Gentile Christian church in Syrian Antioch, Pliny wrote, the historian Pliny, in the strongest terms about the spread of Christianity throughout remote Bithynia, a spread which, in his view, already threatened the stability of other cults throughout the province. Then, 70 years later, still the Paschal Controversy reveals the existence of a Christian federation of churches stretching from Lyon in France to Edessa. Edessa is in the very first country was very, what was the very first country that became totally Christian? Christian nationalism was in what country? Armenia. Armenia. Yeah, that's right. Good. Um, with its headquarters situated in Rome. Then, 70 years again, the emperor Decius declared that he would sooner have a rival emperor in Rome than a Christian bishop. It was, to him, he would rather duke it out with another emperor and not have to deal with a bishop because the bishops had such authority throughout the Roman Empire. So Rome is already coming unglued because of the growth and massive expansion of Christianity and the transformation of the cultures under Christianity. And ere another 70 years had passed when the cross was sewn upon the Roman colors. Roman soldiers are wearing the cross. After 280 years, Harnick is saying, Christianity went everywhere. Well, if you just read the epistles of St. Paul, you'll see that even in his lifetime before he was beheaded in Rome, the gospel had permeated the whole Roman Empire and actually had gone beyond the borders of the Roman Empire into uh, Ethiopia and other parts of uh, the Britannic Isles, way to the north of what we call Scotland today, before the temple was destroyed. In less than 40 years, the gospel goes everywhere. Why? Because of Jesus' life, death, burial, resurrection, ascension, session at the right hand of the Father, seated at the right hand of the Father, anticipating his enemies to be made his footstool. Amen? Yeah, that's weak. Amen? Yes, okay. We can get a little, we can get a little, I'm gearing you up here, okay? In less than 40 years, the gospel goes to the whole Roman Empire. In Rome, they're getting nervous. So then what do they do? They start killing Christians. Let's shut them down. But the more they did that, the more the church grew. Look at our situation right now. Who's being persecuted? They, they think we on the Christian right, they call us, the Christian nationalists, is the label they're giving us, that we're, we're, we're causing a civil war. Uh, they're causing the problems. They want us to rebel, but we're rebelling with preaching the gospel, gathering together with no masks on, choosing not to be vaccinated, oh, dare I say that, um, we're not taking certain marks, and we are just saying Jesus is Lord, and uh, we're singing together, and we're gathering and breaking bread together, having Holy Communion together, and the church is what's going to bring, through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, and from times of refreshing from our Heavenly Father and our Son, bringing blessing to America. America will be revived. It's in the process of it right now. But now we see all the powers of darkness trying to, to diminish that. But, as Jesus said, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Now, either we believe that or we don't. That's what it comes down to. I choose to lean Jesus' way. I'm not going to buy into the fake propaganda media that tells a different narrative. All right, well, what does this have to do with, um, I've got four minutes here before our break, the, uh, the growth of Christianity amongst the English people. Anglican ethos, Catholicity and independence. British Christians, Arl, which speaks of a council, uh, early church council, and Celtic Christianity. 
The historic roots of Christianity in Britain seem to date back to the time when Christians traveled from the continent through the influence of the Roman Empire's extension to this region. Much speculation exists concerning, the, the, concerning who these first Christians were, but we have early accounts from the African Tertullian in the year 208, Anno Domine 208, when he mentioned Christians in Britain, and about 40 years later when Origen in Asia in the year 239 said, well, this includes Britain among the places where Christians are to be found. The former Bishop of Ripon, uh, John Moore, uh, Moorman, discloses that in the year 314, three British bishops attended the Council of Arles, and that this revealed the establishment of the church on a diocesan basis. So in, in England, by the year 314, when this council met in Arles, there were three bishops sent, which meant that there were already well-established churches and in many ways, we find evidence of Christianity emerging amongst Roman slaves in Britain in the first century. But by, uh, and even as Tertullian said, you've got the expansion of Christianity by the year 208 throughout the Britannic Isles. Now, what I, what I did here, and you probably can't see this, I've taken... Uh, some dates. I'm just going to read a little bit for the next two minutes, so hang with me. In the year 60 BC, Gaius Julius Caesar made war against Britain, yet could not hold the kingdom. By the year 43 AD, and now we're in the first century, Christianity brought to England by Roman soldiers and slaves. In the year 167, Lucius, a king of Britain, asked the bishop of Rome to be made a Christian. In the year 249, martyrdom of the first recorded Christian martyr in Britain, St. Alban, who was a Roman soldier, a Roman uh, officer, who was so impressed with a Christian man uh, that was going to die for his faith, that this officer took off all his armor, put it on the Christian, and said, here, they'll, they'll kill me instead. I am a Christian because of the testimony of a Christian man that was willing to die for his faith. So the first recorded martyr is in the year 249. In the year 300, Constantine was at York. 314, Britain sent bishops to attend the Council of R, three bishops. In the year 410, Romans depart England and Saxon invasions begin. By the year 430, Pope Celestine sent Palladius as first bishop to the Christian Scots to the north. In the year 432, St. Patrick arrives in, in Ireland. In the year 449, English are invited by the Britons to Britain. Five, 565, Columba, not Columbo, the detective. Columba came to Britain from the Scots, uh, taught the Picts, these are the people in the northern part of, of, uh, of north of England, Scotland, they built the monastery in Iona, 565. In 596, Pope Gregory sent Augustine and his monks to Britain to evangelize the English because churches had already existed, but he wanted to unite them, and he wanted to bring them under the Roman Catholic Church. In 597, Augustine and monks arrived in Britain at Kent. 604, East Saxons received Christ through Archbishop Melidius' ministry. 604, the founding of St. Paul's Church in London, and it still exists to this day. St. Paul's Church, I've been there. 625, Paulinus is consecrated bishop of the Northumbrians. 626, in flood, daughter of King Edwin baptized on Whit Sunday with 12 others. 627, King Edwin and his people baptized on Easter Sunday. 644, Bishop Paulinus. Uh, of York and Rochester died. 651, Bishop Aidan died. 653, Middle Angles were converted under Prince Piedas. Oui. In 655, the Mercians became Christians. This is the, the western part um, in the area what we call near Liverpool today. 663, 
we have the Synod of Whitby, 664, Chad and Wilfred consecrated bishops of the Northumbrians. 668, Theodore consecrated bishop. 673, Archbishop Theodore presided over the Synod at Hartford and developed 10 canons or rules for the church. 678, Bishop Wilfred expelled from the sea by King Egfred. And then he goes over to north, the northern part of the Netherlands called Friesland, and he evangelized the Frisians. So he got kicked out of his own country. Oh, I might as well go evangelize over there. And it wasn't and not easy to, it's not easy to minister amongst the Frisians. My mother-in-law is Frisian. Um, I love my mother-in-law. She's with the Lord and uh, I was her pastor for many years, but, but they're tough people. The Frisians, right there? Yeah, tough people. 680, Synod at Hetfield, the presidency of Archbishop Theodore to affirm the Catholic faith. 690, Northumbrian missionaries evangelized Frisia. So now they're going into Friesland again, the northern part of the Netherlands. 704, Ethelred became a monk after ruling the Mercians for 30 years. 716, Egbert converted Iona monks to the Catholic Easter and canonical tonsure. And I need it because I'm running out of time here. Just look at this list from 731 to 899. You got the venerable Bede in 735, Alcuin, who was invited by Charlemagne, who was a, a, a British uh, theologian and teacher. He became the main advisor to the Holy Roman Empire under Charlemagne, and that was a Brit. Uh, I'm trying to just show you Christianity spread rapidly and it affected the whole culture. Education, the media, the arts, politics, Christianity permeated in every area of life, every sphere of authority. Um, you go to the, When the Vikings invaded in 835, by the way, the Vikings came in and they massacred uh, and slaughtered monks, destroyed monasteries. The monks were smart enough to hide all the the, the books of literature and copies of scripture, they raped the nuns, took them as their wives, and yet eventually these women nuns that were Christians that were raped eventually evangelized those Viking men. And where are the Vikings today? The only Vikings that exist are in Minnesota because Christianity conquered the Vikings. Well, by the time of 871, and this is where we're going to take a break right after this, 871, Alfred the Great and Ethelred, his older brother, fight the Danes. Ethelred dies. Alfred the Great, from 871 to 899, saved England, brought all the tribes together uh, against the hopeless odds and the greatest just king. And we will see the first thing that he did as the king over all the people of England is he took the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue, and said, this is our starting point for law. We're going we're gonna to order our society according to the Ten Commandments. 899, Alfred's reign, more literate priest, and learned, learned laity, and you have the monastic reforms. And there's King Alfred the Great. Let's take a 10-minute break. All right. So, King Alfred the Great... He's the only king in English history that was called the Great. Um, I could spend the whole day just talking about his significance, but all I'll say is a couple of things from a few quotes I have here. Uh, but first of all, uh, the Church of England's prophetic voice to the culture and to the state um, in uh, the development of Christianity within what we call the United Kingdom now, England, Scotland, Ireland, Wales. You have uh, the coming together of the church and state. And of course, in America, we, 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 we don't like that approach. Um, so we don't want to have a state church, but we do have a state church. It's called the public school system. 
chew on that one for a while. That is the state church. It has its own theology, which is anti-Christian. Um, it has its own disciplines, its way it views biology from a Darwinian perspective, not from the creation account of the Bible. Um, I, I went to a public school up until uh, 12th grade, uh, but I've seen a major shifting away movement. It, originally, it was designed by Protestants in the 1800s, uh, but later um, the secular humanists took it over, which was strategically planned by uh, Dewey and Horace Mann. Uh, and so they developed a socialistic approach, which has become very Marxist in its approach. And it, so it has the, the Marxist worldview. And, uh, and all you have to do is try to... I remember the day when, even when I was going to a public school, that you could still pray. Beginning of the school day, they would ring a bell and everybody would stop and you could pray if you wanted to. Uh, but they even took that away. And uh, however... Again, will God visit the public schools in America? He's already doing it on a public university campus, um, even though you could say Asbury has a Christian heritage, but they went way left a long time ago. But in spite of that, God moves. And all kingdoms and every kingdom shall be shaken. All things will be shaken according to Hebrews 12. The only thing that will not be shaken is what? The kingdom of God. And so even though we have a state church in America called the public school system, um, and that's not, I'm not opposed to those that are in the public school system. We have a lot of representatives here that are in the, in the Great Heart schools. Um, and also at Arizona State University, we have representatives here. Um, so we, we try to serve as salt and light within that. But it is a state church. So don't think that America does not have a state church. Um, Rush Dooney wrote a book years ago, years ago called The Messianic Character, The Messianic Character of American Education. And he's talking about how it was strategically moved uh, into a state church. So the idea that um, you can't legislate morality Law is central to everybody, and all systems have laws, and humans are religious in nature, and all law is religious in nature. So is it going to be the Christian religion, or is it going to be some other kind of ism that is anti-Christian? So King Alfred um, organized, got all the tribes together, fought against uh, the Vikings. Long story short, short the one of the main Viking leaders uh, was ready to get killed because he thought, okay, that's the end of me because we just lost. And King Alfred took him to the chapel where King Alfred and his men hid in the swamp region to a little parish church. And it was there that King Alfred said, I'm not going to kill you, but you are going to become a Christian. Now, uh, I don't know how that affects your theology, but uh, the Viking king became a Christian, and then they baptized him, and then King Alfred said, now you're my brother. Because of the waters of baptism, you're my brother. And then they had, uh, anyway, that was the end of the Viking, end of the Viking Empire. Um, and Christ had conquered through the English people. King Alfred immediately, I'll just read some stuff here. Uh, what evidence is there where a biblical Christian worldview did influence Britain's culture and state? Philip Quenby argues in his book, Magna Carta Unraveled, The Case for Christian Freedoms Today. Quenby said this, The law code of Alfred the Great made it clear that English law looked first and foremost to the Bible for its inspiration. Saxon law acknowledged what continental legal systems did not that a ruler is under judgment just as much as a commoner. Hence, his authority is always subject to the law and his power is limited. The preamble to the Magna Carta made precisely this point by having King John declare that the charter had been given for the improvement of our kingdom. End of quote. 
Uh, also from this same book, uh, there was a contribution by Linda Rose. She stated the following about Alfred the Great. Alfred the Great, uh, and again, this is um, this is back, you know, Alfred the Great, uh, 18, uh, I'm sorry, the year 871, 871 to 899. Uh, as a as the king of England. Linda Rose said this, Alfred the Great knew exactly what he was doing when he prefixed the Ten Commandments to his legal code because it is our primary relationship with God that alone gives equal value and honor to the individual and allows justice to prevail, protecting men and women against the arbitrary exercise of power by tyrants. It was an understanding shared by the architects of Magna Carta it is for these reasons that we once again need to defend our rights. Rights come from God, and uh, they understood that. Um, England was predominantly Christian. So today in the discussions on Christian nationalism, it always would have to be that through revival, through God awakening a people, and uh, I was saying this to the guys last night at the restaurant. What would happen if 80% of the United States became Christian? 80%. And the people began to say, we're sick and tired of secular humanistic laws. They seem to not protect the innocent. They seem to do injustices to the innocent. Um, let's get back to some kind of law system. And so the arguments uh, on the Christian nationalist approach, whatever your views are on that, is basically to say, Maybe God, just maybe God has uh, some answers to this. By the time we get to the Puritans within the next hour, I will give you their view on God's law and society. So King Alfred was informed by the Bible, and we today would be wise to adhere to the biblical command, do not remove the ancient landmarks that your fathers have set. Proverbs 22, verse 28, it's mentioned a few times in Proverbs. Do not remove the ancient landmarks that your fathers have set. Therefore, the monuments that are being torn down should not be happening. That should not be happening. They're trying to, this is all Marxist ideology. It's a Marxist worldview that has permeated our culture. However, Christ is Lord over the United States of America. Can America be revived? Yes. And this is where I want to go, because in the post-millennial vision, there are times of judgment that even the people of God go through. We got the whole Old Testament to prove that. The people of God sinned, God punished them, and allowed them to be exiles uh, in foreign countries, and allowed their enemies to rule over them in their own countries. And then God visited his people again. It's all throughout the Old Testament. Let, let us look to the Old Testament for some examples for our learning. Can God revive formerly Christian nations in Europe? And the answer is yes. Since the 1990s, I go back and forth to Europe with a message of hope for the people there. And there's a remnant of people that are emerging that actually do have a hope that God will visit them again. Within the post-millennial vision, it's, I, we believe it's a biblical vision, and it's basically this, Jesus is king, seated at the right hand of the Father, anticipating all enemies to be made his footstool. That should be in our prayers daily. All right. Um, it is with this historic understanding that our forefathers belief in law and order that we can now consider the reasons for Western civilization's development. That said, these spheres of government are divinely ordered to function because they are based on an orthodox understanding of the one and the many. Now, a little bit from uh, my PhD work on the missionary Roland Allen, an Anglican missionary who had a very optimistic outlook on the kingdom of God permeating the world. Uh, in fact, he wrote for a publication, um, uh, and the, in, in the publication, uh, the, the group of guys that he worked with, one was a Congregationalist, one was a Presbyterian, he was an Anglican. It's kind of, kind of good. Um, he said this. At Roland Allen, well, I'll, I'll first of all preface it. Roland Allen had a vision of indige indigenization that was based upon St. Paul's precedent 
and on the independent development of English Christianity. He argued that this was a historic practice of Anglicanism. In our own history, he said, in our own history, St. Augustine, this is of Canterbury, was consecrated bishop, not of England, but of Canterbury in the year 597. And at that time, all the bishops derived from Augustine were natives, or they were indigenous leaders within their own country. An argument can be made for native leadership to emerge through the means of a foreign representative's prompting, as in the case of Augustine of Canterbury. I will refer to this as translocal apostolic ministry, or what is generally called foreign missionaries. The English church's self-governing process was actually initiated by foreign leadership, and yet was able to quickly propagate indigenous bishops and priests, uh, presbyters, without foreign restraints. This in no way dismisses Celtic Christianity's earlier influence before Augustine in the 6th century came on his mission, especially St. Patrick's uh, work of church planting in Ireland, Columba's missionary work in Ireland and Northumbria, and Iden's work in Iona and Chad's um, in Iona. This is a continuation of missionary work also of Paulinus in York and Rochester. These are ancient um, cities, Christian cities in England's history. So Alan says this about in our own English history about St. Augustine. So it says, he was, uh, Augustine of Canterbury was consecrated a bishop in the year 597 by Pope Gregory the Great in Rome. Seven years later, there, there were two other bishops in, in these cities in England, Rochester and London. Forty years later, by the year 644, a native was consecrated to Rochester, and he by himself consecrated the first native bishop of Canterbury in 654. And at that time, all the bishops derived from Augustine were natives, or they were indigenous to England. So that means within 60 years of Augustine's landing, this occurred. Of course, nearly all the clergy were natives. If we imagine Bishop Stubbs' uh, book, we find that the last of the Augustinian mission to be consecrated was Honorius in 627 to Canterbury. In that year, Felix, a Burgundian, was consecrated at Dunwich. At Dunwich. After that, only foreign bishops that were there outside of, the Eng of England was Theodore of Tarsus, the place where St. Paul was from, in the year 668, and he came to Canterbury. Agilbert in 650 to Dorchester, Lutherius in 670 to Winchester. Both these last were uh, from Paris which was much nearer uh, in every respect to the south of England than Canton or Shanghai was to Peking, which is modern-day Beijing. Between the years 669 and 687, Theodore, was cons he consecrated 20 bishops. And a bishop is over a cluster of churches, what we call a diocese, over many churches. One bishop is like a grandfather, presbyter, or leader uh, over multiple churches. All of them were natives or indigenous. So if we look at the seas established, the seas are the, the main like headquarters. Litchfield was founded in 656, and all the names of its bishops are native, indig indigenous. Lindsay was founded in 678, and the names of the bishops are native. At Dunwich, after Felix the Burgundian, all the names are native. At Elmham in, in 673, to the year 1055, they're all native. So they're not bringing any outside leaders from other countries, in other words. In fact, C after C was established, and C after C was established with a native bishop. So basically what Roland Allen is saying here is this, his forthright appeal to the historic English church's ability of adjusting to current needs by consecrating a sufficient amount of bishops to blaze new trails for church extension between these centuries, the 7th through the 11th centuries, is an example of how he reasoned when dealing with contemporary challenges 
in his own 20th century. So Roland believed that the Pauline emphasis on leadership gifting provided a contextual setting to argue for historic apostolic ministry once again, as evidenced by those first wandering evangelists and prophets, not known by the established order of the apostles. These are, these are people that went and planted churches before the apostles got to those cities. And that was in the cities of, the Bible says in Acts, Antioch, Lydda, and Rome. So before Peter and Paul got to Rome, the churches already were planted in Rome. So we call that spirit before order. Then the order came in, the apostolic order came in after that. But churches were already planted. Why? Because Christianity was spreading rapidly. Why? Because everybody was a missionary and everybody's preaching the gospel that had been touched by the Holy Spirit. All God's people said? All right. All right, I've got a lot more to read there, but I need to uh, move on because I think I'm running out of time. What time do we have right now? 10.50, okay. Okay. Um, that's Roland Allen there. Um, I spent four plus years reading his archives. These dates now, uh, and I won't go over all the details here, but it shows uh, from the year 939, so after Alfred the Great, it shows how Christianity permeated every aspect of England's life. Saying the same with Scotland, Ireland, and Wales. There was a, a day in England's history where every single person was a baptized Christian. Think about that. All right. So between 939 going up to 1384, here's where John Wycliffe, John Wycliffe actually dies. He was a professor at Oxford, but he got kicked out because at that time the church went woke. In England's history, the church would go woke at different times, what we call woke. And then all of a sudden, people would repent, turn back to God, and the wokeness would be chucked out. Can God visit his people again? Yes. We have what book in the, what part of the Bible of the canon of Scripture to give us plenty of stories of God visiting his people again and again and again. The Old Testament, that's right. <laughs> right before our eyes. All right. Um, by the time you get to the 15th century, you have uh, Gutenberg's invention of the printing press and then Luther, and Luther then translates the New Testament on Gutenberg's printing press, and the next thing you know, Reformation takes place all throughout Europe, not just Germany. The Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Cranner, was writing letters to Martin Luther, as was uh, Archbishop Cranner was in contact with John Calvin in, in Geneva. So you have the spread of the Reformation Anyway, all these dates, uh, we're going to make all these notes available for you. So I'm just going to let you go through all of these dates on your own. Then we come to the year 1662. Now, for us Anglicans, that's an important year because Thomas Cranmer put together what's called the Book of Common Prayer. Now, what kind of eschatology was prevalent in these, in Archbishop Thomas Cranmer and others? Now, I didn't know this, but when I was in my mid-20s and I was a Bible college teacher in New Zealand, it was a Baptist uh, theologian that actually pointed out, he said, you know, you're a, a rut, your you're post-millennial viewpoint, that's prevalent in the Church of England. I said, well, yeah, I see bits and pieces of it. He said, study it out. Now, this is a Baptist guy that became acquainted with. And so 
He taught at the same Bible college I taught at. Um, so I checked it out. Can you see that? I'd like for my TA to come up here. In. Oh, Joey. Grab the Book of Common Prayer on the left side there. Hold it up so everybody can see it. Okay. You're going to be real busy this week if this leg doesn't get any better. <laughs> All right. So I'm just preparing you for next week. All right. So in the Book of Common Prayer at the very beginning, you have daily readings of Scripture. And it covers everything. And Thomas Cranmer, the Archbishop of Canterbury, who eventually was burnt at the stake for his faith, uh, the Roman Catholics didn't like him. Um, and there were some woke Anglicans also that didn't like him. But that said, um, you know how each year Easter is on a different day. Like this week, right, uh, Wednesday is Ash Wednesday, February 22nd. Last year, Ash Wednesday began in March. So that means that Easter always falls on a different day, correct? But there's a pattern. There's a pattern throughout our calendar where Easter pops up on certain things. And so there's a table. This is a table of, uh, to give you an idea of when Easter will come. Like if you want to look at 10 years down the line, or if you want to look at 20 years down the line, or if you want to look at the year, what's the bottom one? And cost and trunk and eight thousand. Eight, what is it? Eight thousand five hundred. Eight thousand five hundred, and then it has etc. after that. You tell me, were the seventeenth century England uh, uh, Christians in the Church of England, and that includes a lot of Puritans that still stayed on, others that left and became independent or went Presbyterian. Um, did they believe Jesus was coming back right away? No. And so this, this Baptist minister, you know, kind of put me on like, okay, I need to do some research about the Church of England. And at that time in my mid-20s, I didn't really think highly of the Church of England. But as I began to look at it, in their own prayer book, they're anticipating Easter is going to come at least to the year 8,500. Now, the next slide here is from a 1928 prayer book, which goes up to what year? Go ahead and say it. 8,400. So they got a little bit woke. They dropped it 100 years. But they still kept the major part. The point is, nobody knows when the Lord is going to return. But if you believe that the church is here for the long haul, then we have time to evangelize and disciple the nations. Amen? Okay. So, if the Lord, there's my question. If the Lord is not in a hurry to come back until all enemies are subdued to him, and we then see the blessedness of the gospel going to all the nations— then we have time. Now, in my tradition as an Anglican, when we build church buildings in England, they built them to last for centuries, not for just 40 years, because they had a hope for future generations. Now, I'm just pointing out if if the people of God are thinking with a message of evangelism and hope, what will this do? And in 1662, the next thing that t transpires is the emergence of major missionary movements out of the Britannic Isles. Now, it had existed prior to that uh, amongst the, the monks in the monasteries that evangelized all of Europe. Many of them came from the Britannic Isles. They were singing the psalms and chanting the psalms weekly in the seven hours of the day uh, under the Benedictine order. 
So in other words, monks would go through the whole book of Psalms singing it once a week. You can only do that for so long until your theology pushes you out of your house. And what it did was it pushed, their theology became a theology of dominion for Christ and his kingdom. And they, the, the monks went and evangelized. One of the greatest stories is of St. Boniface going to Germany. A quick story here. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. Let's give him a hand. So St. Boniface, um, this is before the Germanic people had become Christian. They were, they were Celts, but they were uh, pagan Celts. Uh, and so Boniface and the monks went to uh, this region, um, and I actually have it in my notes, so when, if you get a copy of it, you can read it for yourself. I'll just summarize it. They came to this area where the people were killing little babies at the foot of a, an oak tree. And they believed because lightning bolts had hit this oak tree on many occasions, but the oak tree never fell over. And the people had concluded that this tree was the altar of Thor, their god. So Boniface and his fellow monks tried to get them to stop killing babies, sacrificing their babies to Thor. And they were not successful. But Boniface had a practice with his monks, and they would go on to usually a hillside and then look down at the region, and they would pray. Well, some idea came into Boniface's mind that was quite unique. The monks came back with Boniface. They came with axes. And while the people were worshiping Thor and sacrificing babies there, Boniface and his fellow monks began to hack into this oak tree. And if you've ever cut oak wood, if you're, uh, if you're into uh, wood stoves or fireplaces, uh, oak is a very hard wood. So they hacked at this tree. The priest, uh, the Celtic priest, were trying to stop them, but the priest just, the monks just kept doing it. They chopped the whole tree down. And when they chopped the tree down, the people all converted to Christ because they saw that their god, Thor, did not stop the god of Boniface. They all converted. He baptized, he and his fellow monks baptized thousands upon thousands of people. And then Christianity spread throughout German, what we now call Germany. Um, that's just one story. So that precedes by centuries the Reformation. All right, I'd like to, uh, I'm going to jump way ahead here. Again, I have like 25 pages here, so um, I knew I wouldn't get through all of this today. Let's just go up to um, John Calvin. Now, John Calvin was not an Englishman, but Calvin theology, and I believe he had a post-millennial viewpoint, I will show you. Um, the Calvin's theology influenced the Church of England big time. And on our, our confessional statement called the 39 Articles of Religion, uh, Calvin's fingerprints are all over it. Okay, Cal John Calvin's post-millennial vision of evangelism and mission. So let's see here. There's Calvin. Notice that beard? All right. Now, Greg Bonson argued that we thus conclude that Reformed theology was launched with a post-millennial perspective, a heartfelt confidence in the promises of Scripture to the effect that Christ would subdue the whole world with the gospel. The dogmatics, commentaries, and prayers of Calvin form a beautiful and orchestrated presentation of an eschatological hope which would become a doctrinal distinctive and motivating power throughout the history of Reformed Christianity. Now, Ian Murray, um, Eric, uh, if you could come down and, and hold up uh, the book that has the rubber band on it. 
Uh, it's right in the middle there, The Puritan Hope. Ian Murray wrote this book. This is a very good post-millennial view that shows in the life of Calvin and the, the uh, Reformed Christians that uh, they had this post-millennial understanding of where things were moving. Uh, it's historically done very well, this book. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a great read. Uh, so Ian Murray said this, Calvin believed that Christ's kingdom is already established and unlike Luther, he expected it to have a yet greater triumph in history prior to the consummation. Now, we all uphold Luther also in high regard, but Luther's eschatology needed some work, in my opinion. Um, now, John Calvin, here's, here's some quotes from John Calvin. Uh, and this is uh, an interesting quote. To make the thing clear, let us suppose two worlds. Let's see here. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, to make the thing clearer, let us suppose two worlds. The first, the old, corrupted by Adam's sin, the other later in time as renewed by Christ. It hence now appears that here the world to come is not that which we hope for after the resurrection, but that which began at the beginning of Christ's kingdom, but it will no doubt have its full accomplishment in our final redemption. In his commentary on Psalm 47, now this is Psalm 110, so we'll wait, um, Calvin said this on Psalm 47, when God is called a terrible and great king over all the earth, this prophecy applies to the kingdom of Christ. The prophet then, when he declares that the Gentiles will be subdued so that they will not refuse to obey the chosen people, is describing that kingdom of which he had previously spoken. We are not to suppose that the here he treats, I'm sorry, we are not to suppose that he is describing that kingdom of which he had previously spoken. We are not to suppose that he here treats uh, of that secret providence by which God governs the whole world, but of the special power which he exercises by means of his word. By these words, he intimates that the kingdom of God would be extended to the uttermost, the utmost boundaries of the earth, so as to occupy the whole world from one end to the other. So in Calvin's thinking, the kingdom's going to spread everywhere to the whole world. That's his view on Psalm 47. Well, in Psalm 110, he said, he explained this. In this psalm, David sets forth the perpetuity of Christ's reign and the eternality of his priesthood. And in the first place, he affirms that God conferred upon Christ supreme dominion, combined with invincible power, with which he either conquers all his enemies or compels them to submit to him. In the second place, he adds that God would extend the boundaries of this kingdom far and wide. Christ should not reign as king upon Mount Zion only, because God would cause his power to extend to the remotest regions of the earth. John Calvin's comments on the passage in Isaiah 60, verse 4, also says this, lift up your eyes all around and see, they all gather together, they come to you. Your son shall come from afar and your daughter shall be nursed at your side. And then he goes on to say, the church shall not be limited to any corner of the world, but shall be extended as far and wide as there shall be space throughout the whole world. Out of Geneva came a great missionary movement and they, sent, they trained pastors, they had developed an academy there, and they sent ministers out to the remotest parts of the world. In particular, they evangelized Europe first. So even though John Calvin is known as the Protestant reformer in Europe and was not serving as an ecclesiastical representative in England, it's important to recognize the significance of his theological influence upon the Church of England with his books and letters of correspondence. Uh, even uh, what I said about his influence on our uh, 39 Articles of Religion. Now we come to Martin Bootser, 
Martin Bucer was a major Reformed theologian within Germany and Switzerland, but was later asked by King Edward VI to serve in England as Regis Professor of Divinity at the University of Cambridge in 1549. Bucer's view of Christ's kingdom included the eventual conversion of Jews to the Christian faith, based upon his understanding of Romans chapter 11, verses 25 and 26. This same understanding was predominant among the English Puritans. There is the University of Cambridge where he taught. Then we come to Peter Marcher. This Strasbourg reformer, who later served as a theological professor of the University of Oxford, held to a similar view as Bootser did concerning Romans 11 about the Jews. For, and he says, uh, and this is from, I'll read verses 25 and 26. Um, in Romans 11. For I would not, brethren, that ye would be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. And so all, is, so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Peter Martyr argued in his 1558 commentary that Israel was to be understood in a literal sense and not in a figurative sense. Again, a similar interpretation is found in the writings of many New Engl uh, New later English and New England Puritans. As Greg Bonson correctly pointed out, that in 1560, the Geneva Bible produced by Scottish and English refugees that a note alongside this passage in Romans 11 said this, He showeth that the time shall come that the whole nation of the Jews, though not every one particularly, shall be joined to the Church of Christ. This is not an anti-Semitic statement. This is the opposite. Other than the fact that people could rebel and say, well, Jews don't want to become Christians. Puritans believed that the Jews would become Christians before the second coming of Christ. That the whole world would be evangelized and then ultimately all Israel would be saved. And they view this, many of the Puritans view this in a literal sense. Deeply rooted within Puritan post-millennial theology is this belief that the Great Commission ought to be extended among those of the Jewish faith. This is a very positive outlook toward Jews by the Puritans, who subsequently in evangelized the Jewish people in various parts of the world. By the 20th century, ma many evangelicals of the dispensational theory began to evangelize the Jewish people also, although their implementation of their premillennial eschatological views is totally different than those of the Puritans with their postmillennial message of the gospel's eventual triumph among the Jews. And then I put this little statement here. It's rather ironic that the dispensationalists were, uh, have been living off of what I would call the capital of their post-millennial Puritan forefathers in terms of evangelizing the Jewish people. So when they put the accusation against us, and this comes from many evangelicals, that we, um, what, what, what's the argument that many evangelicals say about post-millennialists? When we deny, they say we deny uh, evangelization of the Jewish people. <laughs> Anti-Semitic, they call it replacement theology. Replacement theology. Whenever I hear that, I go, just read the Puritans. There's no replacement theology there. Okay. So then we come to William Perkins. By the way, there's Peter Martyr. William Perkins, this Reformed Catholic Puritan, he wrote a book, though, titled that, taught theology at the University of Cambridge in England. He wrote a commentary on the Epistle to the Galatians in 1617, which also carried this emphasis. Here's what Perkins said. He was, a, again, a famous Puritan. The Lord saith, all the nations shall be blessed in Abraham. Hence I gather 
that the nation of the Jews shall be called and converted to the participation of this blessing before the end of the world we know. Then you have Richard Sibbs. a famous Puritan preacher and lecturer at the University of Cambridge. Uh, by the way, I was in the uh, Bodleian Library in Oxford, and I was trying to find some... I was in the Duke Humphrey Library, which is unbelievable. Oh, what, did you ever go there? Yeah, it's incredible, isn't it? I'm asking uh, some a question to the lady that's working there in the library, and... Uh, uh, I needed some help on where to find something. And I, I, behind her is this big portrait of Richard Sibbs. I said, oh, my goodness, Richard Sibbs. She said, what? And I said, oh, the portrait behind you, Richard Sibbs. And she says, who's that? So I thought, okay, like, you ought to know you're a librarian here. But anyway, that's a famous Puritan. And I gave her a little spiel, but okay. I think she thought I was crazy. As a famous Puritan preacher and lecturer at the University of Cambridge, Richard Sibbs frequently articulated his post millennial vision of hope for the church. Here's what he said. The Jews are not yet come in under Christ's banner, but God that hath persuaded Japheth to come into the tents of Shem will persuade Shem to come into the tents of Japheth. Genesis 9, 27. The fullness of the Gentiles is not yet come in. Romans eleven twenty five. But Christ that hath the utmost part of the earth given him for his possession, Psalm 2, 8, will gather all the sheep his father hath given him into one fold, that there may be one sheepfold and one shepherd, John 10, 16. Let no man therefore despair, nor, as I said before, let us despair of the, of the conversion of those that are savages in other parts. How bad soever they be, they are of the world, and if the gospel be preached to them, Christ will be believed on in the world. Christ almighty power goeth with his own ordinance to make it effectual. And when the fullness of the Gentiles is come in, then comes the conversion of the Jews. That's Richard Sibbs. Now, we come to John Cotton. The English Puritans who sailed to the New World can claim Calvin as their, as their father because their worldview was organized after the model which Calvin developed for Geneva. These Puritans embraced Calvin's theology that clearly defined a socio-political framework and then sought to apply this within the new cultural milieu they were ready to create. As the New England Puritans were developing their theological framework for the application of God's law to every area of life for these colonies, here's what Greg Bonson pointed out. And this is a, a quote from Bonson now in reference to John Cotton. Perhaps the most famous theologian of the 1630s and 40s was the Puritan leader in Boston, John Cotton. The text which appear on the title page of his farewell sermon to those sailing for New England on the Arbella in 1630 evidence his belief that all nations of the world will come to acknowledge the living and true God. The colonists were to bear in mind that God's millennial purposes must be served by their efforts, especially in the evangelization of the Indians. Cotton soon came to New England himself and in 1642, he produced three significant millennial studies. And here's what he believed. From the Turkish downfall, which means the fall of Islam, the Turks were the dominant ones in the 1640s, that the Puritans were arguing that the, the Muslims would be converted to Christ. That was their belief. An age of peace and rest for the church. Cotton's writings did much to propagate the postmillennial interpretation 
of unfulfilled prophecy. His opinions were quite influential on many other writers. Furthermore, it is clear from Oliver Cromwell's correspondence with John Cotton, as well as the history of the New England colonies, that's our country, that Cotton's post-millennialism guided and motivated significant social and political leaders of his age. This was the development of Christian nationalism in America. Even Oliver Cromwell, who was not, he was not in the Church of England, right? Would, how many of you know who Oliver Cromwell is? There's a statue of him in London. He's held in high regard. Many English still laugh at him, but... <clears throat> John Cotton's political influence is here noted in his work entitled A Discourse About Civil Government in a New Plantation Whose Design is Religion, published in Cambridge in 1663. Cotton, perhaps in association with John Davenport, wrote that a theocracy is the proper and best form of government to endorse, and he defined a theocracy as where the Lord God is our governor and where the laws by which men rule are the laws of God. Cotton's theocratic ideal did not confuse church and state, neither did it blur the difference in Scripture between cultic and restorative laws, which anticipated the redemptive economy of Christ and moral laws with eternal rectitude or holiness as their essence. This is from Greg Bonson's book. I have it up here. Victory in Jesus, the Bright Hope of Postmillennialism. That quote is found there. Well, the postmillennial hope of the Puritans influenced their view for the development of higher education as an extension of the Great Commission. So, in other words, postmillennialism was at the heart of, of transforming culture with truth. And so what happened? The very first institution, Harvard in 1636. And the affili affiliation were Puritans. In 1693, William and Mary College was developed by the Anglicans in Virginia. In 1701, Yale was established in Connecticut by the Congregationalists, by the Independents. In 1746, Princeton in New Jersey, was founded by Presbyterians. These are all Puritans. Even the Anglicans, you know, which struggle with some Puritans, they still had this understanding of a post-millennial hope that integrated their approach and their world and life view. In 1754, King's College in New York, founded by Anglicans, also was an extension of this hope that they had. In 1764, Brown in Rhode Island, Brown University, was founded by the Baptist. In 1766, Rutgers University, established in New Jersey by the Dutch Reformed Christians, the Dutch Reformed Church. And in 1769, Dartmouth in New Hampshire was founded by the Congregationalist. This can be found in uh, information, a lot more information on this, in Gary DeMar's book, America's Christian History, the untold story. Well, the, the biblical worldview that the Puritans had that were in the New England colonies brought with it this idea that we need to influence education and it must be founded upon the lordship of Jesus Christ over every area of life and over every area of academic study. Well, let's go back to Scotland. So yeah, bring in the Westminster Assembly, and there were Anglicans among them there, okay? Don't forget that. Westminster Assembly. Samuel Rutherford, one of the Scottish commissioners of, to the Westminster Assembly, Samuel Rutherford, author of Lex Rex, The Law is King, expressed his post-millennial vision of hope and victory. By the way, my grands, our grandson, who just turned 15, goes to a Christian school here locally <clears throat> for Christmas, got me a necklace which says, <clears throat> Obey God, 
resists tyranny, Lex Rex. I thanked him, hugged him like, okay, grandson, you get it. You get it. Obey God, resist tyranny, Lex Rex. The law is king. Well, Samuel Rutherford, Rutherford expressed his post-millennial vision of hope and victory. Here's what he said. I shall be glad to be a witness to behold the kingdoms of the world become Christ's. I could stay out of heaven many years to see that victorious, triumphing Lord act that prophesied part of his soul-conquering love in taking into his kingdom the greater sister, the Kirk of the Jews. Interesting. The Church of the Jews. To behold him set up as an ensign and banner of love to the end of the world. Yet we are to believe Christ shall reign a victorious conquering king to the ends of the earth. Oh, that there were nations, kindreds, tongues, and all the people of Christ's habitable globe, encompassing his throne with cries and tears for the spirit of supplication to be poured down upon the inhabitants of Judah for that effect. That's Samuel Rutherford. So what did that do? Uh, and Rutherford had our guys over here in the United States colonies, they were reading Rutherford. They believed that the gospel would permeate every aspect of life. But let's look now at the Protestant missionary movement. And um, so many mission societies were developed in the 1600s and into the 1700s. It began to propagate again and again and again. It's quite remarkable. <clears throat> um, we're going to look at the Church Missionary Society in 1799 and the Society for the Preparation of the Gospel in 1701. The principles of freedom served as a major influence within Protestant missionary, the Protestant missionary movement. The missionaries' efforts of service stem from their desire to practice the principle of the golden rule. Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. In the midst of their grassroots involvement with the people, Many missionaries were perplexed with the colonial practice of the slave trade. The evangelical emphasis on freedom in Christ seemed disingenuous in light of the practice of slavery. Uh, this is from uh, some of my doctoral work, because uh, I had to deal with colonialism, the good, the bad, and the ugly on this, but listen closely. Basically, it was Christian missionaries who helped pioneer this anti-slavery movement. The belief in the freedom of the individual went hand in hand with the advocacy of free trade. The evangelical missionary societies, far from being the heralds of imperialism at this time, played a key part in outlawing slavery. That said, missionary motivation of compassion flowed from an evangelical awareness to spread Christianity throughout the world. This world Christianity impetus began to encourage 18th century Protestant missionary societies to think more globally. The voluntary missionary societies, be, which began to emerge at this time, though springing up with a conspicuously colonial context, tended to create a grassroots movement which looked to the generosity and compassion of its churches and individual benevolent efforts. And as these missionary societies began to minister cross-culturally, they were confronted with various problematic issues imposed by the colonial powers. In various voluntary mission societies, they recognized the need to address issues of injustice that stemmed from colonial hegemony. How do these voluntary missionary societies originate and what type of people compromise? Uh, comprise their organizations. So the Church Missionary Society of uh, 1799 was a group of evangelical clergymen and laymen, and they resolved that, quote, 
being a duty highly incumbent upon every Christian to endeavor to propagate the knowledge of the gospel among the heathen, end of quote. A society to ch achieve that end be constituted the Society for Missions to Africa and the East. At the helm of the Church Missionary Society was the Anglican Evangelical Rector of Clap Clapham, the Reverend John Venn, who presided as the chair for this new organization. The 18th century evangelical revival had already permeated the English countryside from the preaching ministries of John Wesley and George Whitfield. Now there existed a call for mission beyond the revival's earlier vision. In time, this evangelical renewal produced a dynamic group referred to as the Clapham Sect. How many have heard of this? The Clapham Sect. Nobody? Oh, this is important reading. Oh, one back there. Oh, yes. Okay. The doctor back there. Thank you. All right. Do you agree that they ought to read, read up on this? Yes. Okay. Thumbs up. <clears throat> Members of which included William Wilberforce, Charles Grant, Lord Tainmouth, James Stephen, Granville Sharp, Henry Thornton, Macaulay, and the Course of N. It was John Venn who believed that this call to extensive missionary activity by the Church Missionary Society would, could address the need with this newer vision. Even so, he recognized the need to be connected to the established Church of England, and yet with this distinctive that it is founded upon the church principle, not the high church principle. Wil Wilbert Schenck comments that by one phrase he staked out a position, which clearly distinguished the CMS from uh, earlier established societies, such as the Society for the Propagation of Christian Knowledge, the Society for the Propagation of the Gospel, and the London Missionary Society. It would be inaccurate to think that the CMS was a reactionary society opposed to a high Anglican ethos. Actually, it became noted for its engagement with confronting the slave trade by extending the missionary enterprise to India as well as the founding of the British and Foreign Missionary Bible Societies and the eventual establishment of a model colony in Sierra Leone. This is the Church Missionary Society that still exists today, uh, established in 1799. Uh, Dr. Anderson, how much time do I have? I go to 10 minutes? Okay. So now, this is just one missionary society, but out of that missionary society, William Wilberforce became the main voice against the slave trade Eventually, after 32 years of confronting it in Parliament, the British stopped the slave trade. And then shortly after that, he died. William Wilberforce also gave, um, was heavily influenced by, uh, and it was kind of a mutual thing, with a certain person that wrote a hymn called Amazing Grace. Does anybody know who wrote that hymn? It was an Anglican vicar, Anglican minister. Amazing Grace, probably the most famous American hymn. Yeah, very good. <laughs> John Newton, John Newton, thank you. That was a good clue. Now, the, so the Society for the Propagation of the Gospel. In terms of current analysis highlighting the missiological history of the high church Anglicanism, Daniel O'Connor, I met him years ago, in his book, Three Centuries of Mission, is, gave a major contribution of understanding about this missionary movement since its inception in 1701. And again, what motivated them was a, a very strong post-millennial vision to take the gospel to the nations, to disciple the nations. The society's origination stemmed through William III's charter on the 16th of June in 1701. This charter mirrored, mirrored all the earlier English charters dating back to 1482, which sought to conquer, occupy, and possess all the lands inhabited by heathens and infidels. Now, that would be a very non-politically correct terminology to use. That's how they spoke about the nations, uh, and they were also going to nations that practiced cannibalism. 
So you always have to keep that in mind. A message of Christian mission is portrayed in the society's seal, which bears the inscription from the book of Acts, chapter 16, verse 9, which says, come over and help us. This is a reference to the Macedonian call for St. Paul. In response to this missionary call, O'Connor says that the first two uh, SPG missionaries who left for North America, Patrick Gordon and George Keith, when they set sail on the, the boat called the Centurion in 1702 and arriving 43 days later at the unfortunate turn of events when Gordon, who was appointed as the Society of the Churches uh, to go to Jamaica, not Jamaica the island, but Jamaica Long Island, um, he died of a fever. However, Gordon's idea of a global vision for the propagation of the gospel was undeniably disseminated overseas. Um, and there's a lot more on this. I'll just say that the bottom line is they brought, the SBG brought the Bible and the Book of Common Prayer uh, not only to the New England colonies, but to the whole world. British colonialism, the good, the bad, and the ugly of British colonialism, and not all of it was bad. The missionaries are the ones that actually in the midst were the ones that planted churches and brought the gospel. And many people I have met over the years as a missiologist and being a missionary in different countries with our family, I've had a lot of people from Africa, Latin America, and Asia say, thank God that the British came over and brought us the Bible. And many of the Anglicans also say that they brought the Book of Common Prayer and they established churches. In our wokeness, woke world, uh, you have what's called the post-colonial post theory, and that's all about diminishing the work of the missionaries. Even Pope Francis bought into that uh, and has apologized for sending missionaries throughout the world. Not so. I, let me just say this in case I run out of time. By the year 2050, at the rate of Christianity, because most of Christianity is growing rapidly in Africa, Latin America, and Asia, there are more Anglicans in Nigeria. It's over 25 million plus. 25 million plus Anglicans in Nigeria. That's more than all the Anglicans in England and Canada and the U.S., why? Because a hundred years ago, big revivals hit Africa. Formerly pagan areas and Islamic areas are now Christian. And many of these countries are governed by God's word rather than by secular humanism or pagan ideas. How many minutes? Three. I conclude with this. In uh, our travels as missionaries to different countries, and I've done a lot of work in Eastern and Western Europe also, training leaders over there. I have seen tremendous growth of Christians in the majority world, Africa, Latin America and Asia. I've met with various pastors, church planters that even plant churches in China and they can't tell you where they are planting churches. <coughs> Dear, can you come to my side, please? I need my, my best friend. Other than my whole right leg being messed up, my side is hurt too. So I want to conclude with this. That my wife and I have learned over the years that something very significant is happening in the world, and that is, especially in the last hundred years, it took English speaking missionaries to go throughout the whole world, and now the growth of the Christianity is in Africa, Latin America, and Asia. 100 years ago, out of every five Christians, 
four were white. Only one out of five were dark-skinned. Today, and they estimate this is going to increase by the year 2050, out of every five Christians, four are dark-skinned people. We were successful in sending missionaries throughout the world. Don't let the post-colonial guilt woke crowd diminish the work of the missionary efforts of the people from Great Britain, Europe, and the United States and Canada. We've been very successful. Now those countries are sending missionaries to us. I do a lot of research on this. It's called reverse mission. The fastest growing churches in Korea, they've planted churches throughout the whole world. My wife and I were evangelized by Koreans downtown Oxford by a whole, remember that? Yeah. A whole family with some cousins. And they're sharing their faith with my wife and I in a very unique way. And I, we just let them. We didn't say a word. And they really evangelized us extremely well. And then after about 15 minutes, I said, by the way, we're Christians. I'm a minister. We're missionaries. And I'm doing PhD work here in Oxford about missions, Christian missions. Oh, we had a great, a great time on the streets of Oxford. Mm -hmm. William Carey, the missionary to India, said, expect great things from God. Attempt great things for God. We have the post-millennial hope. It's a biblical hope. God bless.